Welcome everybody, this is the Life Enthusiast Online Radio and TV Network, restoring vitality to you and the planet. I'm your co-host Scott Patton, and joining us as usual is a health coach and life enthusiast, Martin Patella. Hey Martin, how are you doing today? Oh Scott, I'm, I am doing okay, but boy, is my world ever full of challenges. I understand, like you live in the center of British Columbia, Canada, one of the paradises of the world there's mountains and there's green forests and lakes and i understand my son uh, i was talking to him and he says the interior of british columbia is one giant bonfire dad you know um right now the valley is completely filled with fairly heavy uh haze it's kind of purplish it's like you know how we were making fun of the pollution in Beijing, how it, yes. like, the visibility isn't all that great and all of that? Well, we got nearly that, and it smells like a campfire. See, there's hundreds and hundreds of fires going on in British Columbia right now. California has the same problem. Well, in California, 8,000 people were pushed out of their homes. In British Columbia, population 4 million has uh, 15,000 people out of their homes. Wow. So it's proportionately, it's a much bigger problem here in British Columbia. But what's really interesting about that is, of course, how did we get here? Yes. Right? We have, uh, I mean, a week ago, all of a sudden, a dry lightning storm came through. And uh, over 200 fires were started in just one night. So Mother Nature was a little upset because it wasn't someone throwing a cigarette butt or a campfire that went out of control. No, maybe one of these 220 fires was human caused. The rest of it was lightning, dry lightning, no rain, just lightning. And uh, of course, some of these fires are close to uh, human settlements and some are further away and the resources available are limited. So they're now having to triage they're just protecting human structures, and they're actually choosing which structures. So they're now only defending cities and villages. And if it's a small village or small settlement or just the odd cabin in the bush, that's just left to go. Yeah, There's just, they just, we don't have resources to go after all that. Right. So they just choose some battles and battle those. But even still, uh, the uh, firemen are working 30-hour shifts. How do you work a 30-hour shift? Wow. There's going to be some mistakes made and some people are going to get hurt. Possibly, or exhausted, or whatever. Like I myself, for instance, couldn't possibly do a 30-hour shift. It's just not in me. Right. Well, if you're, if you're 20, then... Maybe. Maybe, yeah. But you can't yeah. do that very often because that's... Particularly when it's not it's not just the 30 hours, it's 30 hours in a smoky, hazy, violent, hot environment yeah. that uh, basically is killing everything. Yeah, while wearing a 60-pound suit and carrying 40 pounds of equipment, or maybe more, I don't know, right. and, and dragging a fire hose and, and, and a uh, shovel and a uh, pickaxe and I don't know what else the boys have. It's, it's quite something. I, I cannot imagine a harder job. I think it's harder than fighting in battle. It would be a constant battle, for sure. I mean, even if you're at war, usually, you know, they stop for a while and let yeah. everybody sleep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Maybe. So although, what's... although I, must, I must just interject, just sure. a quick little yeah. sidebar. Germans invented a drug and called it pervitin which actually is methamphetamine. So it's the Nazi Germans who actually invented meth. And, oh. and they gave it to their soldiers. And so when, for example, the uh, Germans were taking Belgium, it was just crazy because the, Belgian, uh, the uh, German soldiers ran through an open field to a hill that had a a well-fortified machine gun nest. Uh, nest, call it that, 
these German soldiers completely without fear ran through open field, through fire, and the Belgians were so freaked out by it, they actually abandoned and ran. Anyway, These stuff like that. These guys are crazy. How could, yes, I could see that. And the other thing that I remember hearing about this was the Germans, when they were occupying Poland, same thing. They, they were issued uh, meth, and they went s three days straight, no sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, the advance of the troops was phenomenal. I mean, the defenders, as you suggested, needed to have their beauty sleep. Not the German soldiers on meth. They that just would explain, end, right? So we need to give the firefighters that. Yeah, that's it. You got it, baby. Oh, and I'm sure oh I'm sure there's no long term uh, problems from doing that. Either. No, none, zero. But isn't it interesting that the masters feel that it's perfectly okay to give stuff to the the Germans call it cannon and footer. They cannon are feet of cannon fodder, fodder, yeah. You know, that the ordinary guy that is going to get sacrificed, he's going to last a month or two or three or four or whatever. When we use him up, we don't care about him anyway. It's like chess, the pawns, right? Yeah, all yeah, the pieces pawns, you yeah, sacrifice. You just, no, no problem, sacrifice. Yeah, you sacrifice all of them at the end, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Well, anyway, uh, I'm in a fairly dark mood with just watching life around me, right? Like I'm, I'm seeing this, the human versus nature interface. Like there is this civilization that we're building. Like I looked at a map of the place where I lived uh, and surroundings from 1952 and then from 2002, two different satellite pictures. Oh, well, 52 was not a satellite, 52 was an air, air shot. But anyway, map, overlays. And the number of roads that went into the forest, that were into encroaching onto the nature, was just so phenomenal. It, it sort of looks to me like, you know, an infection growing into it and taking territory. Yes. And I'm thinking, holy smokes, the interface between the human society and nature as we knew it is just becoming infected by humans. And I'm thinking of Amazonia and, and Africa and whatever else is going on all around the planet where the, the destruction of the environment as we knew it is progressing at a fairly fast pace. Yes, and not only that, we do things to the environment that we're we are not living in destroying that causes catastrophe later on because these fires yep. are the result of 40 or 50 years of forestry management. The management yes. of the BC forests has been going on since the 1940s or 50s or 60s. Right. And yeah, yeah. I can remember being up in the center of this area, a city called Prince George, listening to two old guys talk. And they had a couple of things that they said that I'll never forget. One was the forest is getting old and trees are starting to fall over because they're getting old. So we should be helping to clear it out because otherwise it becomes dangerous. And the other thing was, was they were not allowing like wildfires to go through. So these, these trees would drop all these small branches, just like little twigs, little matches. Yes. They're like little matchsticks. And then sooner yeah. or later, there was going to be a fire, and it was just going to wipe the whole thing out because it would burn very hot, very fast. And Too much would, fuel. And it would move very quickly. And yeah, and what, that's, that's what's happening. Yeah, indeed. And so I guess what we're saying is that the uh, industry has decided to defend the resource, the resource being the standing trees, right? They, they treat it as an asset. Yes. But a short term, right? The short term thinking says... We need to preserve all the tree stands so that we can log it and turn it into profits and timber. And what. Whereas the natural way would be saying, we need to burn some because only by doing that, we will be able to sustain the long-term vision. It yeah. sort of reminds me of farming where you 
force the soil to produce by putting fertilizer on it, right? Like you just push it every year. In in the old times, the practice was crop rotation and and letting fields go fallow, just to have them rejuvenate or restore themselves by not actually growing a, a cash crop on it. You know, you reminded me too of somebody who used to light her grass on fire. Right, and, and she would like burn the grass, and then that right. would put nutrients back into the soil, and it would regenerate. I mean, she didn't burn like acres; she just you know burned a patch here and a patch there, and then it would yeah. come back. And yeah. that's you know, so that rejuvenation through fire is very, very important, and it's going to happen one way or another. Like, there's no, there is nobody who's a forester that that will ever tell you that. There's never going to be a forest fire. They know there will always be forest fires. Yeah, the question but under is, what situation, right? And how big is the forest fire going to be? And I can remember some large ones a few years ago in Vancouver where the wind blew a certain way and all of the, all of the smoke came into the lower mainland. It was hazy and everything else. And, of course, what that does is everybody who's got poorer lungs is in the hospital and everybody who's yep. got good lungs is uh, they're degenerating because you've got all of this very fine ash settling in your lungs yeah. and yes. you can't really get it, it out. Like you can't wash your lungs out. And yeah. so you've got this degeneration occurring because we've yep. created this really bad environment for everybody. It's yeah, very for sure. sad. Yeah, actually, interestingly, how this happened, you know, we've had uh, uh, a bigger than normal snowfall over the winter. So the terrain was really well saturated with moisture in the springtime. So the grasses grew taller and richer than usual. And then, of course, after they've grown nice and tall, then the rains stopped. And so the grass dries out and turns yellow. And now we have this really rich, thick carpet of grass all over the hillsides here. It doesn't take much. And of course, it's just the perfect kindling. Like dry grass burns really quick. Yes. So, so this is catching on fire, and uh, and it's burning. And anyway, I, I mean, the pictures are just so so sad when you see an entire subdivision just gone. You know, there's a guy standing over it and just saying, "Well, there they were. You know, these these thirty houses here in this entire subdivision, and you, you just see it leveled completely, completely gone flat." And <laughs> anyway, tragedies. And uh, just just on the margin, my uh, my trusted uh, editor, <laughs> Anne Louise, who's working with us on uh, on the shopping cart and maintaining a lot of things, working with with us since oh, 2005, I think. She just had an accident at her house. Can you believe it? A barbecue. Grace fire. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. Her barbecue caught on fire and she had it too close to a wood pile that was the wood that she was planning to burn in the winter. So the wood, wood pile caught on, which then lit the house, which then uh, filled with smoke. So she can't even stay in the house. The, the, the structure didn't burn down, only a, a couple of rooms. But it's smoke damage and she can't even be in it and and just the drama of it right just the crazy drama of it i just feel so bad for her because sure enough um i don't get the help she's now got tragedy to deal with her life totally disrupted right and that affects people around her all you know yeah yeah her which actually is us yes we're all connected. I guess that's the other part of the message, right? Yeah, for real. You, you showed me a glass of algae-infested water just a little while ago. Yeah, we were on Erin Brockovich's uh, Facebook page, and she has been fighting for clean water in the United States since I don't know when. Uh, yeah. There was that famous uh, female actress that played her. She, there was a movie about her and everything yeah. else, Julie Roberts. And, yeah. uh, 
and you know, it was kind of interesting. I saw the movie and I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, she had this big fight, this big battle. She won it. And the story. Yeah. And I thought she was like gone. And then about 10 years later, I'm, I find her on Facebook and I start following her page. And every day she is posting about Legionnaire disease in the water in New York, uh, water levels dropping, people testing the waters, the drinking water, the tap water, the water in the schools, finding excess lead, finding excess uh, yeah. bacteria. And of course, her whole theme is that the local utilities, usually run by the city, are hiding the fact that the water out of their taps is dangerous. So things are not right, and um, and the powers and that be, the officials, are fighting to. It's it just reminds me of when tobacco was accused of causing lung cancer in the fifties and sixties. No, it yes. isn't. You know, it was, we've got all these doctors saying no, everything is fine. Everything's fine. until it got so bad that they finally had to say, oh yeah, okay, it probably does. We should put something on our yeah. packages. We want to do. But yeah. it was a huge, huge fight, and we're having the same thing with the water. With there's another yeah. the the one you're yeah, showing is yeah. is and I'll show it in the video is uh, algae bloom in I think it's Lake Erie near yes. Yeah, uh, but you know what's interesting about algae, Lake, right? Algae yeah. algae is a essentially an obligate nitrogen metabolizer. You know, it's you can think of it like the cancer of the lake where if you have cancer in the human body, that's because the glucose has run away. When you have cancer in the lake, that's because there's so much nitrogen in the water that the, uh, that the algae just has to consume it. And well, it so loves this, it, right? I mean, obviously, yeah, you know, we it's, don't it's, like it, but the algae is having a great time. So, well, yeah, it's, look well, at us, it's, party time. Yeah, that's why I'm calling it obligate nitrogen metabolizer. And uh, how does the nitrogen get in there? It's agricultural runoff. Yeah. We fertilize fields upstream or we push sewage like, you know, manure and whatnot into the water. And so, of course, it concentrates from little streams to bigger streams to large rivers and finally into the large lakes. So... Um, there comes an inflection point, right? A point at which all of a sudden it goes bloom. Yeah. Like for the longest while, it was just a little localized problem here and there, just a little blip that gets shut down. But all of a sudden it reaches this point where whoosh, the whole thing goes. I, I saw the Mediterranean around Venice go bloom. The entire bay in sort of the north Adriatic becomes completely unusable. Or at the in the Gulf of Mexico, where Mississippi River goes out into the Gulf of Mexico, there is this dead zone. No oxygen. Nothing lives there. So we're slowly killing off these places, which is just going to get bigger and bigger as we get more and more people. If we well, if we don't change our ways, it's going to hit this um, critical mass. Th this is the this is the strange thing, right? Like for example, this this fire in British Columbia is essentially wiping out entire communities, and the communities were the forestry industry based communities, like you know these towns up there. They are sawmills and people working in sawmills and uh, and trucking that's hauling the logs in and out whatever all of that industry supported activity and by not managing the resource correctly they are now burning up the resource and in the process they are also burning up the towns themselves so it's like I don't know the revenge of the nature. I don't know, but it's yeah. it's it's kind of reminding me that it's fairly fragile. It's possible for us to just lose the whole wad, not in just gradually, right? Like the the adjustment to it is not gradual. The fire has. I mean, people are saying, well, it was ten miles away, and then fifteen minutes later, it was on my doorstep. No time. Yeah, it moved really fast. 
and they probably had many fires around there in the last 20 years, and they just were fairly local, burnt themselves out, or because there wasn't 500 fires going on, they were able to put the fire out using whatever firefighting techniques that they use. Yeah. Just getting back so to the Great Lakes uh, algae bloom, uh, one of the things that uh, she pointed out was 84% of North America's surface fresh water and 21% of the world's fresh water on the surface is in the Great Lakes. And yes. that strikes me as kind of important. Yes. <laughs> you know, like it should be very, very strictly protected. And it certainly seems like it's not. Yeah. Well, it's so big that uh, it doesn't seem like much, right? Like, uh, it's sort of like peeing in a pool. If, if one kid does it, it's no big deal. Yes. But if you have uh, 100 people all peeing into the pool, it's pretty, it's going to destroy the experience. Yeah. Well, actually, that reminded me instantly of the situation in, uh, in Japan where the uh, nuclear reactor is still spilling thousands and thousands of gallons of contaminated water every day. Fukushima. It's not in the, Fukushima. It's not in the news, right? No. It's it's as if it's as if it were okay. Well, actually, it's like visualize now um, just another couple of boys peeing in the pool. Yes, Pacific Ocean is very large. But unfortunately, like with P, that goes away a bit. Uh, the radioactive P doesn't go away. No, that's right. And it gets into the food chain, and then it moves up the food chain. And who's at the top of the food chain? Killer whales and human beings. Yes, sir. Here we are. Yeah, tuna is at the top of the fish food chain, and, uh, and we are eating tuna. That's right. So, of course... Uh, <laughs> Let me just plug in a solution. I am using zeolite every day and eating tuna. So what does the zeolite do? Uh, it actually binds toxic metals, heavy metals like lead, mercury, cadmium, that sort of stuff. And the radioactive materials? Yeah, that too. If it's, if it's in there, it would bind it. And then it just takes it out of your system. Yeah, I pee it out. So it goes into my toilet, from my toilet into the sewer, sewer, and from the sewer into the lake, where the where it infects the trout. So when you catch the trout and eat it, then my lead goes to you through the trout. Ah, wonderful! Congratulations! So uh, eat zeolite. Yes. There is a, another product that we talk about, Biotite. I think it has a new name now. Yeah, we renamed it. Uh, well, no, the, the biotite is a name for black mica. Okay. Um, I have had an argument with the company called Adya Minerals. I just don't like how they do things. Okay. And um, um, uh, how do I say it? So we have been getting their product through a distributor. And the distributors keep changing on us. So we had a, this is a third label that we have on, for the same product. Oh, I see. Okay. It, it, it starts in Japan as something called Rocks Track. And uh, that thing is, um, um, how do I put it? It's, it's a uh, uh, sulfuric acid leach of the black mica, of the biotite. And it, it causes these minerals to dissolve and to become available. And so then they can react with uh, stuff that's in the water and take it out. It's called agglutination. This agglutination process, it's, it's sort of like curdling it up. It's, yeah. It makes it, it, it inactive. It, and if you put it in the water, you'll see at the bottom of the water after, like if you do it at night and you wake up, you'll see there's a bunch of cloudy stuff in the bottom of your water, and uh, that's the removal of the toxic materials from the water. Yeah, yeah exactly. 
Anyway, so yes, that's that's a great product to use too. If you happen to be drinking contaminated water, definitely get that. Will it if you if you're drinking pure water and you and you put it into the pure water and drink it, it'll take the stuff out of your system, right? Yeah, true enough. It's yeah, it will go inside your body and find the contamination and react with it. Good. So there are natural solutions to some of these uh, problems that we've got, but really the answer is not to overload the system and yes. to, to work within the confines of the system as opposed to pushing the boundaries, which we seem to be doing everywhere. Yeah, indeed, you know, the detox capacity is limited, right? Like there's only so much that you can put through the body. So you can only detox one step at a time. Yeah, so if you're toxifying more than you're detoxifying, it's not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so yeah. we talked a little bit about the local environment and how that's impacting the area that you live in. Uh, right. Let's talk a little bit about the political environment because uh, we had high hopes that uh, with a change in the government at the top in the United States that maybe that would cause some things to happen. And what was happening before the change was medical marijuana was being legalized in a number of states and uh, things seem to be uh, shaping up for the, the hemp oil industry and uh, maybe- Oh gosh, it. yes, boy. Well, <laughs> so uh, I remember in the, uh, I guess last year, in the lead up to the election, I've talked to a lot of people who we're saying, well, actually, I am supporting change. And the only way we get to change is if I support Trump. And I'm not necessarily enthused about his personal style, but he stands for change. And he stands for uh, limiting government intrusion into people's lives. And he stands for less regulation, deregulation. And he stands for all these... Well, anyway, I, I felt as though people were projecting their wishes onto the candidate that that there was no, I mean, he never said stuff like that or promised stuff like that. I mean, his, his entire past, his life, his career, all suggests that he's he relates really well to other billionaires, right. that he's, that he's uh, well versed in gaming the system. He was proudly saying that he was gaming the system. He was saying, oh, of course I messed with the taxes. That's because I can. Anyway, so now that we've got the um, Republican majority, it, it looks as though the hopes of the ordinary people into less regulation are going to go unfulfilled because the system itself, as, as we have it, seems to be stacked up and rigged in such a way that uh, those that are able to affect the votes, by that I mean affect the legislators. So you don't need to control the election, you just need to control the 539 people that are running the place, right? And the sad thing is, is that most, <clears throat> there's a lot of senators who have been in power for 40 or 50 years. So they've already uh, decided what they're going to be doing and they've already decided who they're going to be listening to. Yeah. And it's well, they have been the local people that's always been the lobbyists and that doesn't yeah. seem like it's going to change. Yeah, they have, they owe a lot of uh, fealty, allegiance to people who brought them where they are. Like you can't just go and bite the hand that feeds you. So there we are with, uh, <laughs> well, the situation is such, like for example, you started talking about the, uh, the hemp industry. Yes. We are experiencing some sort of a blowback where the Attorney General Sessions declares that he's going to now uh, review all of that. And no, we are totally not letting the uh, CBD out to help people. Of course, the only way I can imagine that this would be happening is because the pharmaceutical companies are not wanting to see their profits shortened. 
because of course the CBD would cut into the opiate business and uh, painkiller business and other inflammatory drug business and depression and anxiety and other pill business because it affects all of those things in a positive manner. So can you imagine this? This is billions dollars of business to the pharmaceutical industry. So sure as heck, they're going to try their best to use their influence to uh, push back on it. And, and and it's sad that they won't take the opposite approach, which is join in and help everybody get better and not be on drugs for the rest of their lives. Right. So here we are. Woohoo. <laughs> Again, I'm thinking, well, people, if you want to uh, change, you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and get engaged, get really engaged. And in local and municipal and state and federal politics, like this unengaged public is easily led and manipulated. I mean, that's probably what Erin Brockovich is talking about, right? Yes. She Engage. wants everybody to get engaged. Call your congressman, call your senator, call your local mayor, your councilman, and get on them. And, you know, it's really amazing, too, because I can remember growing up and thinking, well, I won't make a difference. And, you know, if, you know this, if the city is going to do this, the city is going to do this, can't make a difference. And uh, so at some point, this was sort of ingrained in the system, in the tree teaching, in the schools. I don't know where, but I got, I got that message. And what she's shown is if you stand up and, and just say no, and a lot of parents stand up to the school boards and stand up to the cities because they're going to do something that's going to negatively impact their child. Uh, you, know, there's, you know, nobody wants to take on a mom. Right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the it. mom gets up there and she's like mama bear protecting her baby cubs. Like everybody runs for cover. And, yes. And I think we just need more of that, right? We need to. And unfortunately, like I keep thinking about systems. We have a system where both parents work. But we have a system where when you're not married, you're working, right? So you're, you know, then when you do get married, you continue to work. So the result is, is that you get up at six in the morning, you start work at eight, you get home, you get off work at five, you get home at seven, you're tired, you get, you know, you have a glass of wine. You can, who can fight in that system? I mean, we just set up this, you know, and so all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, this thing is bad for my kid. Well, I don't have the time to actually find out that it's bad for my kid, and then I don't have the time to do something about it. And I know some moms who are stay-at-home moms and raising hell in their neighborhoods and getting their way. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, like, I, this is not the way you're going to treat my kid or this is not what you're going to do in this neighborhood. And because they have the time to understand the issues, to, to get knowledgeable, and because they want to protect their involved, like, 24 hours a day in their children as opposed to two hours and then everybody's sleeping and then they work, uh, it makes a huge difference. So I think we really need, we need to take a look at this whole system that we live under and oh dear. either you know, make uh -huh. small changes, gradually moving somewhere, or it's going to be ripped down because it's going to be like this huge fire that runs right through everything, wipes everything out, and then you start over. It could come to that because I'm, I'm thinking... The real estate business, I mean, real estate has become more and more expensive, especially in where I live. It's just not just buy a little, buy a whole lot. It's a huge and I'm thinking, But I'm thinking a lot of it is caused by people competing with each other, right? Like it started out that it was a one person income family, right? Like the man was working, the wife stayed home, they had two, three kids, and they lived in a modest house that they could afford. But then if you take the woman and put her to work, her she starts getting money. So there's more cash flow in the family. They can afford a bigger home. Yes. But because they can now, afford it, 
they end yeah. up both having to work. Yeah, well, what it does is that the neighbors who want to have a similar home have to pay now more money to get that kind of a home. And so all of a sudden we're bidding each other up, 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 up to the top, right? Like everybody would like to live uh, by the lakefront uh, in a mansion, uh, whatever, right? But not everybody has the kind of money, but still, even ordinary things now cost a lot. Yeah. And, you know, I can remember buying a house and the real estate agent showed a house that was probably 50000 more than we could afford. And then she started showing houses that were 50000 less than we could afford. And, you know, it was like once you saw those houses, you didn't want the cheaper houses. And they knew that, right? And then then you come to this compromise where, well, you know, if, if you stretch, you could make this yeah. house. And yeah, so I'll then, pile just not to here, up to here. Oh, yeah. no, maybe all the way to here. Yeah. And then you... Yeah. And so then you just you're just able to make all the bills, you're just able to pay everything, but you've got this yeah. house. And yeah. you're all excited about you know, what a great house with this and everything else. And yeah, yeah. And uh, it's just the wrong way to do it, but it's a part yeah. of the system, right? Like look at this yeah. house. Oh, it's so nice. Look at this house. Yeah. Oh, it needs a little paint. Oh, I don't want to paint. I want a nice yeah. house. One broken leg or one car accident away from completely losing the whole work. That's right. The whole, yeah. And our Anyways. whole system and society is built on that. I mean, you look at, you look at downtown any city, you know, where they have renovated it or they've upgraded it or whatever, and you'll probably find a bunch of people saying, I can't believe they did that because they built this big monument, like we didn't, who needed that monument, right? Or we built this big uh, building. I can remember my ex was a dental hygienist and her monthly dental hygienist association fee was like $4. They had, you know, they, they rented an office in a little building somewhere and they had two employees. Not nothing much. Nothing much. Yeah. She moved from the center of the country out to Vancouver. At the same time, the association decided they wanted a building. So they built this building and they had, you know, 50 employees in the building and they had a mortgage on the building. And so she was paying $200 a month for her to be a dental uh -huh. hygienist to cover yes. this extravagant thing expense. that they expense that had no benefit to anybody except yeah. the people working for, you know it's empire building you see it all the exactly time. that yeah and that's how governments work yes each organization is sort of like a one-way thing it just all it knows it's grow yes it and doesn't know how to how to not grow yeah and i think that hits on the problem like we mm -hmm. you know we every city where we've had We've grown 5% this year. We've grown 5% yeah. this year. It's like, how about shrinking and yeah. having less of a footprint on the environment? Yeah. Having, yeah. you know, using up less resources. But it's, we've got so, these two parts with, no, 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 we need to have our GSP yeah. or GDP or whatever it is go up yeah, 10%. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, we're in recession. We don't want to be in recession. No, maybe we do want to be in recession. Yeah, so I forgot to time our session differently because my uh, landscapers just showed up. I don't know if you can hear, hear it. On... No. Okay, good. Hey, I wanted to mention something. Look, look what I've got here. See this? Cherries. Can you see it well? Cherries. It's cherry season. My wonderful wife, she went out on the weekend and climbed on a ladder and picked some cherries, and uh, and they're wonderful, and I'm enjoying them. <laughs> And once a year, or about four days, too much. That's right. And, and I, then I have so much of it that I have to give it up for another whole year. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we have this abundance, and then we have this scarcity going on, don't we? Yeah, exactly. That's it's the crazy thing, right? The cyclical nature of things. For for three weeks in the year, there are cherries on the trees. And they're then they're gone. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. Which is another thing: eating raw and eating local. Oh yes. 
Hello, Glen Rock. Yes, sir. Makes, well, a, makes a big difference. So how do we how do we translate all of this into actionables for us, right? I I so want to encourage everyone to to think globally and act locally. It's such a worn phrase, and yet it contains so much wisdom. It just it says that you have to understand consequences in the big picture. Because if you if you only do myopic things, you end up blowing the wad. This was this example of the forestry industry that myopically protected the trees from burning, which then created a problem so big that now the whole thing is going up in fire and flame. Yeah, yeah and then they're going to come out and they're going to say, you know, that the, the economic cost was hundreds of billions of dollars. Oh, yeah, we're, yeah, this this here, $200 million spent this year on firefighting. That means uh, each person in the province is spending $50. That doesn't seem like much, but um, 50 bucks here, 50 bucks there, pretty soon it adds up to something. That's right. Yeah. So actionable steps. Yeah. See what your, well, con we'll see what your city hall is doing. Yeah. See what your school is doing. Yeah. See and what your grocery store is doing. Yes. And then see, see what, what your local farmers are doing. Because there's local yeah. farmers everywhere, and yeah. if you can, you know, if you get to know them, like I have a friend in Vancouver, and she she knows the farmer that grows the chickens and the pigs and the beef that she eats, and she's been there and seen them slaughter the animals and make sure that you know it's humane and and yeah. not a mess, and she's seen where they go and they cut the meat and everything. Like she's seen the whole thing, right? Grew up on yes. a farm, so she kind of knew what she was looking for. When you start talking to some of the people that are creating the food that you're eating, you get a feel for you know what they're all about. I love blueberries, and I get them from a farm in Coquitlam outside of Vancouver, <laughs> and I know the people that run the farm. And they said, "Yeah, well, yeah. we put a little bit of uh, fungicide in the, in, the, in the spring, and then we don't put anything else on for the rest of the year." And yeah, it's just, and they say everywhere else around here. The grocery stores send people around and tell them when to spray. If you don't spray here and you don't spray there, we're not buying your crop. And it's like, oh. So there's this mentality uh, that the grocery stores know better than the farmers on how to produce their crops properly, which, of course, is probably run by the herbicide companies. Yeah, they have their fingers in it, don't they? Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Well, I guess the revolution starts right here in the wallet, in my wallet. When I pull out my cash or credit, that's the moment when I'm having to decide who going, who's going to get the economic oxygen, the money, right? That's right. Wherever, wherever I put the money, that's what grows. So when you're spending money with us, you're giving oxygen to people that make healthy foods and support you with great mineral supplements and the likes. Think about it. That's a great On that place note. to end. So you've been watching and listening to the Life Enthusiast online radio and TV network, restoring vitality to you and the planet. And Martin, if somebody wanted to know more about uh, how life enthusiast line of products could help them how can they get in touch with you we're at www.life-enthusiast.com and uh, we're on the phone at 866-543-3388 call us yes give them a call he'll be able to help you with uh, a lot of your health questions uh, until next time everybody thank you very much for joining us Bye -bye.